Hello and welcome to Teaching My Cat to Read, the very serious book review podcast. I'm Eli. I'm Em. And I'm Lottie. And this week we're discussing everything about Northanger Abbey by Jane Austen. <laughs> I just do it all the time now. Oh, I oh, do. Oh, this book, fun time. It's a fun time. Um, it's, it's a wild ride. Just like the opening of it is so funny. I was I was about to launch straight into. You know what it reminds me of? I don't actually have a terrible summary for this. <laughs> like the closest <laughs> I came was I love it when it's busy in the Regency novel and Jane Austen gets mean. <laughs> <laughs> I I I I was thinking like main character syndrome in a gothic novel but everyone else <laughs> around her is normal. Yeah. She I Well, she I don't she, know that they are so much. I mean, they're like they're not they're not their um gothic equivalent they're not archetypes. In the gothic novel, but they're, they're, not they're in also the, yeah. like yeah. They're like they're like normal human messy, not gothic novel messy. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we're not talking Castle of Otranto here. They're like they're they're annoying Jane Austen character messy. Yeah. We're not talking like your son died and you're trying to make off with his fiance messy. No, they're like normal no, no. human stupid. It's Regency messy. Yeah, exactly. Do, do, do one of you guys want to um give a a lowdown on who the main characters are? because I will get them it's mixed up. It's really sweet that you expect me to remember. I finished this book. I finished this book literally an hour ago and I remember maybe the main character's name. Okay, and should I go like through it. the character list on, uh, on Sparknotes that I have up? Because, you know, that's, this is a that's high how... quality podcast where we give you, you know. insightful <laughs> and deep uh, okay, analysis. My, de- my degrees are in STEM. They are not in arts, okay? I need the notes. <laughs> I haven't written an essay since GCSE English. Meanwhile, I write words for a living. <laughs> <laughs> yeah now my degree definitely isn't in literature nobody nobody look at me but you have written an essay <laughs> yes once yes. ever okay characters. characters Catherine Morland main protagonist she's 17 one of many children basically uh, gets taken off to Bath by the Allens who are like the I family guess, friends family friends sponsors mostly very boring the Allens yeah they don't really boring. do much which I is think fine. Mr. Allen seems like a decent dude. He just doesn't do anything. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. I'm a big fan of not doing things. Yeah, and like when he does butt in, it's usually sensible. He's usually like, mm. I will, mm-hmm. I will give good advice, and when asked, and otherwise, will stay in my lane, which I appreciate in a man. Yeah. And it's and it's deeply antithetical to being in a gothic novel. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so he's not mm-hmm. in it very much. <laughs> yeah, the Allens like are there, and then the Allens' friends are the Thorpe family of which they have three three children one of which is Isabella mm. Isabella Thorpe I think they have they have Isabella has two younger sisters I think there are six Thorpes in total we don't meet two of the brothers oh it's three sisters that's it this is the, the, in this we see the beginning of Austin's trend of the spare sibling it's yeah. not an Austin novel unless there's a bunch of uh, siblings that are like barely mentioned by name and have no personality they're just there yeah. in the background running around being kids mm-hmm. they're there to make up the numbers I love so thinking about uh, Catherine Morland and her family the, Mo- the Morlands the intro to this book is basically talking about how Catherine's life completely fails to live up to the standard of like making her a gothic heroine and how yeah. you might expect her mother to have dial- died in childbirth bringing her into the world but actually she went she survived and went on to have six more children and she enjoys excellent health and is just a general sensible woman um, yeah. <laughs> and obviously this this deep you know this poor Catherine has had her chances of being a gothic heroine forever ruined by this fact yeah, yeah. It's like yeah. by all her family being sensible and caring people it's just like yeah she's not even an orphan how, how will she ever faint in a haunted castle doesn't you know? even live in a ruined castle like yeah, no. how will she cope and then i guess the other main sort of family that we have to mention are the tilneys so you've got henry eleanor and then general tilney their father and there's an older there's a useless older brother as well as oh well, and there's yeah. a useless older brother who turns up well he's not quite useless um he's, 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 he's involved a in a plot later yeah he's a bit mm. of a cad but yeah i don't know if you i didn't realize that this book was published in two hearts like i'm pretty sure it was written in two halves like she wrote one half when she was younger and then the other half later in her life and then it was published um, after mm. a death like persuasion i mean mm-hmm. i so i could didn't t- i couldn't really tell that while while we were while i was reading it that didn't jump out at me like the book feels kind of like there's the bath section and then there's the abbey section like yeah. i think that's yes. very like yeah but i think having heard that what strikes me is 
it's the bit where the parody gets some heart. Because I was, I tell you what, I was really struggling with the first half of this book, right? Because I was mm-hmm. just like, I don't care about any of these people. Mm-hmm. Like, I care about Catherine, just about. But, like, everybody else, I'm just like, eh, yeah. It's when you get okay. the friendship between Catherine, Eleanor, and Henry, so two of the Tilney siblings. Like, yeah. when they start to become, like, actual friends who talk about things and share opinions and look yeah. after mm-hmm. each other. And that's the point where I got invested, because it's like, oh... Now these now these are people. Yeah, exactly. And I feel like that falls it falls kind of neatly into two halves in that sense. Yeah. Um, in yeah. that there's the, there's the half of here are a bunch of like two dimensional idiots to interact with our protagonist. <laughs> yeah. And here is you know um, here is the with the real people and like the Austin characterization that we we know and love and and like yeah. both the Tilney siblings are just very sensible and nice and have like mm. reasonable opinions and whereas. Yeah. So um, one of the things that happens when Catherine first comes to Bath is that she meets this um, this girl, Isabella Thorpe, who is the yeah. daughter of a school, like now grown up school friend of Mrs. Allen. So they're sort of like friends of the family, essentially. Mm-hmm. And Isabella is so obviously this this shallow, sort of vain, just mm. completely, uh, yeah. She's like the Caroline Bingley. I feel like she's a Caroline Bingley. Uh, okay, see, I... I know, I know this is just me having a thing for mean lesbians, but like, Caroline Bingley, th- do not sully Caroline Bingley's name by comparing well, her to this bitch. Like, <laughs> Caroline Bingley, like, uh, Car- okay, I will I acknowledge that Caroline Bingley has flaws. Absolutely. But like, she's not this stupid. Like, no. she's a lot more consistent. She's a lot more intelligent. Caroline Bingley would never jilt anyone. No, and mm-hmm. I think I think it's more, I guess, in the sense of like me coming, re- like I hadn't read this book before um, mm. and like, yeah, the only Austen I'd read before we did this podcast was Pride and Prejudice. <laughs> so like, it's kind of my only like point reference. <laughs> Is there a character in Persuasion? It's been, I, I've kind of forgotten a lot of Persuasion, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> is there a character in Persuasion that Isabella is comparable to? I feel like there is a sort of, like, not quite, I guess gold digging yeah. is the equivalent. Like, she's very much looking out for her own interests. She's not really interested in sort of being uh, consistent. She's very flighty. She's mm. very flighty. Yeah. She's very like, and she's got she's got that in common with her brother in a sense. In that, like, she will say one thing and then directly contradict herself like two seconds later. Like, yeah. you can't trust anything she says. Oh, I think her brother is the worst character in all of Austen, to be honest. Yeah. Apart from like, he, ah. well, maybe Wickham. I don't know. I mean, I hate the the elder Elliot so much from Persuasion that it's like oh, very that's hard a good for me point. to yes. like sway from that. But mm-hmm. I, I appreciate what. Isabella's position is is that at the end of the day she's a woman she needs to marry well Mm. and so that's kind of her goal but at the same time she's kind of like when you're introduced to these balls I feel Mm. in Pride and Prejudice again only reference point but like Mm -hmm. maybe in more pop culture everyone's like oh we're going to the ball isn't it exciting we're going to meet lots of people and Catherine is very excited but another thing that came across to me is like she's also not quite reserved but she doesn't know the topics of conversation she knows yeah. novels and that's it. She doesn't know painting. She doesn't know singing. She can't play a, a, a musical instrument. She doesn't she know can't languages. Draw. Yeah. Mm. Mainly because obviously at that time, like you were either taught what your what your mother knew or you mm. were sent away to boarding school. You had a governess. And so there was a big range of what, what you'd learn. Mm. And there was this bit earlier in the book where it talks about how so her mother had six children after her and it talks about her so much of her mother's time being taken up with lying in which is the period when you're like extremely pregnant and you shouldn't really go anywhere or do anything mm. um and then like having the children raising the children so yeah her mother mm. didn't have a lot of time to teach her anything that she might otherwise have got yeah i don't know i mean the way the way that it because it does talk about her education and it's like partially in a kind of like see she's not a t- she's not like other gothic heroines tm look how unsuited she is for the role yeah. she likes being outside and she won't apply herself to her lessons yeah which like you know adhd icon honestly yeah <laughs> it's not that she doesn't she isn't taught it's that she just doesn't She's not interested. It doesn't stick. It's not her she thing. Doesn't, yeah. She doesn't, yeah, she doesn't no. really care about it, which is completely fair and valid. But like, there is so much of her, like, just not having a clue ever what's going on. Yeah. And it's as much to do with like people skills as it is a like knowledge base. Yeah. Experience, maybe, I guess. But, like, she reminds me weirdly of um, the uprooted protagonist, Agnieszka, in the like, when she turns oh, up at court and she's like, it just doesn't occur to her. That, yes. like people will be mean. Yeah, and one of the reasons mm. that Isabella kind of strings her along for so long in, in their friendship is that 
she believes Isabella when Isabella says things. And yeah. she can't understand why anybody would behave the way that Isabella is behaving. So she, she tries to see it in the best possible light, but she's like... There's ages where she's, like, really upset by the whole, like, Isabella... So Isabella's, like, engaged to her brother, but then he's flirting with... Ca- she's flirting with Captain Tilney. It would be a different novel if he was flirting with Captain Tilney. Damn. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and she just... It doesn't compute for her at all. She's just like, well, you're engaged, so you shouldn't be flirting with this other dude. She must be doing know? it unconsciously. She must not be intentionally, like, yeah, doing this yeah, yeah. harm to my brother. She wants to believe the best out of people. I feel it's kind mm-hmm. of in that sort yeah. of naivety of a... At the end of the day, she is 17 and Isabella is... Four, 21, uh, I think. 21, 22. So mm, for yeah. comparison's sake, I think Jane in Pride and Prejudice was 22 and Elizabeth was 20. So mm. if you compare that in the sense of I feel Isabella is this sort of naive but also sort of leading guys on, I don't know if I would call her naive. I think she's sort of... Oh, no, maybe, like, yeah, she's, word. she's sort of... She's quite, like, adept at the social stuff of, like, knowing how she'll be perceived. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's probably a bit... Like, and, and I was going to say, it is worth noting that, like, Catherine's tendency to just, like, believe the best of people and not... Never assume malice because it just doesn't cross her mind is one of the things that endears her to the Tilneys, who are, like, actually her friends and actually decent people. Yeah. Like, mm. yeah. it's one of the things that... So, Henry Tilney is the, the her suitor. Um, yeah. Or one, one of her suitors is the one she ends up marrying and he's actually nice and there was a couple times throughout the novel where he says things like oh well you know you you aren't getting it because like you aren't getting the situation because you're too nice because you you just like it's to your credit that you wouldn't assume that of somebody which i think is quite nice yeah yeah like he recognizes he does recognize that in her as like a valuable thing instead it's not that she's stupid it's just that she isn't cynical like at all yeah yeah it definitely came out for me like so henry first meets Catherine at the first ball they go to um, and then he like wanders off into the I don't know throng of people I think it might or whatever. be yeah very is early on one? at least I think it, yeah, might, be, I think it might be the on. second one because the first one is like it's just spent lamenting that they don't know anyone it's like two oh, hours yeah. of them just not knowing anybody yeah there's there's a while of like we don't know anyone and then it's just Miss Allen going I know nobody I've been there I've been to awkward house parties like that before I know that feeling oh. <laughs> I know I, I felt that in my soul when they're late let, let, was it Alan was like oh I don't know anyone oh, I wish I could talk to someone I'm like I know but the problem is in that time you had to like you know, obviously have someone introduce you, but yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's just an excuse, isn't it? Like, none yeah. of us none of us are going to be at the, in that situation at a party and then being like, I will just introduce myself to people. You can't do that. You don't want to be Mr. Collins. No. Yeah. No, no. I will, like, you know, talk about other things, you know. Anyway, <laughs> yeah. um, but where was I going? Oh, yeah, I remember. Um, the <laughs> bit where, so, so Henry and Ella are in town and they invite Catherine on a walk and then mm-hmm. Isabella basically just, blocks it and says you need to go on this carriage ride with my brother mm. her horrible brother who is like creeping on Catherine. he is mm. he is the epitome of creepy and then Catherine sees henry and elna and uh, john thorpe doesn't stop the carriage he's like that and she Catherine gets very upset by this so the next day when isabella tries to do the same thing Catherine's like absolutely not i'm going to go and see my friends and i mm. was very very happy with that but it kind of brings me on to the point of john thorpe I'm sorry, but the person I want to punch the most is this guy ah, with ah. a f- like. Yeah, he, he's what, terrible. What, and what what sort of not annoys me, but I'm like, we've met these people. I've definitely met a yeah. Thorpe <laughs> who's just so f- full of themselves. This guy's like, he just oh. sees Catherine and is just like, oh, I will marry you, like with no consideration yeah. of whether or not she is into the idea. And and mm. it's just the fact he he keeps going on about how he's like, oh well, my carriage is the best, my horse it's is not the even. best. Like objectively, um, his carriage is kind of like trash. But he's got the same thing of Isabella, where like you can't believe anything he says, and he will no. turn on a dime, contradict himself about anything. And poor Catherine's just sitting there, like, "What's going on? <laughs> what do I believe? What? What? What's the point of this conversation?" It's just like Catherine basically just agrees with everything to basically eventually make him shut up. Which who has not been there? Like that is the thing you do when you are talking to someone you don't want to talk to. Yes. What is the um the line from Sense and Sensibility where it's like she liked him too little to offer Oh the compliment of a rational argument. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was just like Catherine was just going, Okay, okay. 
Just smile okay. and nod. Okay. Smile and nod. Like, I can't leave this. This is a moving carriage, but I wish I could oh. fling myself out of it right now. <laughs> oh my God. It comes back to bite her a little because she doesn't then realise later on. And part of this is not her naivety, but partly it's her like actively not wanting to pay attention to him is mm. that he's been courting her this whole time. Mm. And yeah. later it's sort of Isabella tries to basically manipulate her by saying, oh, well, my brother thinks that you're basically engaged already. And Catherine has no idea and has just been trying mm. to fend off this overly friendly guy mm. yeah and obviously he's been willfully interpreting literally everything she says as could as being like mm. yes i will marry you but because she's been like not paying attention to him and just being like smile and nod she might have picked up yeah. on that a little earlier but then if he had it, she might have like if he'd been even slightly less repulsive things might have been different <laughs> yeah i i kind <laughs> of it's... feel that um her like her, I say naivety is. I definitely read it as like there is clearly no chemistry between them at all. TM, like obviously, yeah. Mm. Duh. I think he's meant to be older as well because he's older than Isabella. Who's is he about the same age as Henry Tilney? Who's like twenty six? Yes, he's twenty six. He's, okay. he's got to be the same age as more as um, James. James Morland. Mm. I think because yeah. that's how okay. they're. So they maybe he's even younger. Acquainted. Yeah. Also, that he implies that he doesn't drink made me laugh. Like, <laughs> oh, you know, he says specifically like, nobody drinks at Oxford. I'm just sitting there like, honey. Honey, honey, we know darling, people who dear. went there like absolutely <laughs> not. No, 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 yeah. no. There is free rhyme with a lot of things. <laughs> I mean, you just have to look at the was it, the Daily Mail every June to know, <laughs> know that oh, drinking God. happens. At How Oxford. dare like, these students have fun? Fun, yeah. <laughs> but it's just like I was really going, uh, mate. Uh, <laughs> really? I think it's funny though that it's like he says that and then he explains like more in more detail about like what he considers to be drinking and what people actually do and it's very clear that people do in fact drink at Oxford it's just that he drinks more than yeah. most people he's at like, Oxford he's like oh well <laughs> you know everyone else they only have two glasses so you know if I'm only drinking five then you know it's the same I can't remember the exact quote but it's like that it's just compared to me nobody drinks at Oxford is the thing yeah. <laughs> uh, and it's kind of like you're listening to this I listen to the audio but going Mm, that's bollocks like I can hear this <laughs> like what you're saying is crap like <laughs> just you know what he is he is the embodiment of that Chris Fleming song the wildly unlikable guy oh so, have yes. you heard that no yeah. I feel yeah. like yeah. It's, it's so funny I'll send it to you Lottie it's okay. really but it's just like the whole it's like telling the story of like you've accidentally walked into this guy at the party and you're like oh god what's happening you're trapped now like and then you real and then you real you're like Oh, you see him like interacting with somebody else, and you realize he's the problem, not you. I was just uh, like, no, he's just yeah. Austin does such a good line in Unlikable Guys because there's obviously there's Mr. Collins, mm. um, and then and then there's this guy. Uh, yeah, just just like people that you meet and on site, you're like, I hate you. Yeah, and like there, I think actually I was going to say when we were talking about Isabella um, thought what struck me about her was that I feel like she doesn't compared to Caroline. I feel like she doesn't have any depth, right? Like, Austin has not really... Her, her, part of the reason her motivation doesn't make sense is because Catherine is an inexperienced young, seven, like, 17-year-old who isn't used yes. to, like, fancy people lying about everything all the time. Yeah, people being sort of duplicitous or shallow or... Uh, like, high society bullshit. <coughs> but I think part of it is also that, like, she is literally just there to be the silly, frivolous flirt mm. who can't be relied on. You know, so yeah, I she's, she she's sort of. That much I guess she's a foil depth. to Catherine in that sense. Like they're mm. both sort of doing society around the same time. They both have similar timelines for like meeting somebody and mm. getting engaged to them. But the way that they go about it and their motivations are like just so different. Yeah, but I, I mean, I, I, I mean, I would kind of argue that I don't think Isabella like plausibly has any motivation. Mm. Like she throws away if 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 she's just there to like marry well or marry rich or whatever, she throws away two people. Like she loses Tilney, she's she throws away Moreland. Like I okay, that is a question I had. Like, how does she mm. lose Tilney? Because is it because he was never that interested in her in the first place? It was just a flirtation that's sort for of him. What, that's what Henry implies, isn't it? Yeah. So basically, what happens is Isabella is engaged, becomes engaged to Catherine's older brother mm. James, who by all accounts seems a nice guy. Mm. Um, and Isabella is very beautiful, and so you know he's just like, oh, a beautiful woman wants to marry me. Great, let's yeah. do it. Um, but mm. while they're engaged, Isabella starts flirting with Captain Tilney, who is Henry Tilney's older brother, and Henry Tilney is the man that Catherine is is sort of mm. uh, courting. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and so Catherine is like, oh, how can Isabella possibly be flirting with this guy? Doesn't she know she's hurting my brother? And trying to ask Henry what he thinks his brother is playing at by flirting with this woman. Mm. And it's never really, I don't know if it's made clear exactly how seriously the captain is taking it. And I think the answer is like, not very. And so Isabella mm. goes, oh my gosh, I have a flirtation with this guy. I better throw over my current fiance who I mm. know doesn't have that much money uh, in the hopes of mm. securing this guy who has more. And then he goes, oh, yikes, I didn't think you were serious. And like, scarpers. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's what happens, but it, it's not actually textually made clear, I don't think. It's, it's one of those ones where we actually don't ever get the, the full story out of the horse's mouth. We get like a letter where Morland sort of dances around it to Catherine. We get a letter from Isabella where she like straight up Tries lies to walk it back. About, yeah. yeah. She's trying to get Catherine to help her reconcile with, with James and Catherine's like, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And like yeah. Henry, Henry's kind of reading the letter and going, "Oh, I think this is, you know, it it what it seems like what has happened is this." And yeah. Catherine's like, "This makes no sense to me." But sorry, where I was going with the bringing back to the Isabella is that I feel like the men actually are consistent in motivation. I feel like the men, mm-hmm. the men, I don't go, I don't know why you're doing this. You know, I'm like, it's like you're an obnoxious, <laughs> but I've met obnoxious <laughs> like you, and I know what's happening here. But yeah, when I, I feel like this. the women, when the women are being <laughs> it almost feels more like... Who are you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, you know, we will... Everybody everybody knows somebody who's got, like, one topic of conversation that they barely leave or whatever. I don't think that's necessarily unrealistic. Oh, yeah, Mrs. But Allen like, is completely consistent. She's boring. But Isabella, yeah, yeah, yeah I yeah. agree. I don't, I don't get it, like, mm. what she is about. And it might be that she's 21 and she doesn't, you know, she doesn't get it either. Because, mm. like, 21 yeah. is a stupid age to be anyway. <laughs> um. <laughs> but like i think it, it kind of stands out i i think in the like catherine is such a like interesting character in that she's very like you know she's kind of she's unfinished she's 17 she doesn't know what she don't know what but she up, has but opinions like, and she has a personality and like yeah. principles. And, or you can see them developing and there's like consistent things where like she doesn't lie mm. yes. like she's really bad at lying she doesn't see the point and she doesn't want to which like that's that's how I am, so I feel that's very real. Like I'm just yeah, I'm too yeah, lazy yeah. to lie. Yeah, <laughs> which she's also got the like the she as she kind of ignores subtext. You know that Tumblr post that's like actually one of the things mm-hmm. my therapist told me to do is to just like I just do not deal in subtext at all because it makes me too anxious. If you need to say something to say, me, you say, say it, it straight, and yeah. I'm not I'm yeah. just not going to pay any attention to any like undertones or passive aggressiveness because I just don't have time to like angst and stress about that. I tell yeah. you what, it's been an absolute joy of being an adult though. And that was actually what came across to me in like the conversation with John Thorpe mm. was the like mm. she's just ref- it's not it is a bit that she's trying to make him go away and she's like she's got another engagement and she just wants to leave. But there is also an element of like she is just point blank not dealing with the subtext. She's yeah, just like, absolutely oh, well, not. the polite thing to say here would be if somebody's like, oh, I'd like to come visit your parents is to be like, well, I'm sure, and she says, I'm sure they'd like to see you. She doesn't yeah. say, like, because she's, that's the polite thing to say and her parents probably would be nice. But he reads that as you can approach my parents to ask them yeah. for my hand. You can marry me. Like, she's kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place, I feel, because she can't, without mm. sort of shooting herself in the foot in this from a social sense like tell them to f off mm. but yeah. at the same time she is you know she's basically saying that as straight as she can mm. without causing like i say shooting herself in the foot from a social standpoint yeah. like yeah. she can't just without you know, causing piss offense. everyone off yeah well and it's part of him like deliberately reading into it what he wants to hear right yeah, yeah he yeah, wants yeah. to hear that she wants to marry and him. i don't think it even occurs to her a that she needs to tell him to f- off because to, to her mind he hasn't said anything that's explicitly like i'm interested in you how do you yeah. feel about that which is also like i mean if you read it i think it's pretty like he hasn't actually he's gone are you interested in marriage at all um, do you think marriage in general is a good idea? And she's like one foot out the door, like, yeah, it's fine. I'm not nothing against I'm, the institution. I'm leaving this conversation. <laughs> and like, I don't think it even occurs to her that like, yeah, that there's anything for her to like push off. Like she just, yeah. it doesn't occur to her that he's even interested, mostly because he's been a dick to her this whole time. Yeah. Like she's very straightforward in that and sense. And she also doesn't think that she's given him any encouragement. Yeah. And and she hasn't. It's, it's again, him aggressively reading into things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's interesting because I feel like it's 
that this this novel is kind of unbalanced between the like you've got these very shallow caricature characters some of whom make more sense than others and some of whom are yeah whatever but like and then you've also got, yeah, Catherine, who's very complicated. Henry Tilney, who I think is really interesting. Like, mm-hmm. the mm-hmm. level of, like, pedantry and, like, teasing and the way he's approaching conversation. I actually enjoyed his dialogue, you know? Yeah, yeah. Like, he was interesting to me. And I don't- he seems to genuinely like Catherine. There's one passage, like, towards the yeah. end of the book where it basically says, like, well, initially he was only interested. Like, the only reason he was ever interested in her is because she was interested in him. He was like, oh, my God, a pretty mm. girl is into me. But throughout the course of the book you can see that he does actually like her and value her opinions and he talks Mm. about her with the books that she likes and sort of reassures her that she's not vapid for reading them because she's just like oh well i didn't think men like novels you know they think they're very silly and he's Mm. like no novels are cool i'll talk about you novels i'll talk about i'll talk about novels with you and it's quite interesting because i think it's like Mm. one of the you know when he when she says she knows nothing about art and they're going they're going for a walk i think it's up the hills just outside of bath mm-hmm. if you don't know bath very well it's quite hilly um it's quite nice views over over the city and she's oh i don't know anything about art i don't i don't know like what the latest you know in things are in in portraiture and the he's picturesque. just picturesque like, oh, let me yes. explain it to you you know rather than saying oh my f- god you should notice you're you know as a woman you should know ev- you know know this kind mm. of thing what the hell he's just like he's you like, are one of today's lucky 10,000 you know exactly he's like yeah. let me tell you everything I know about all the art and books yeah. and it was just a really it felt a really yeah. real conversation like you'd have yeah. now there was know? a really funny line around that section where it says something like um, oh uh, a naive and ignorant and good natured girl will always attract a knowledgeable like a knowledgeable and sort of gentlemanly young man mm. to explain to how like you know there's there's a certain, there's an implication there that it's like it's also flattering to his ego to be treated as an expert in that way mm. but it yeah. works for them and it's not mean spirited and it's like he's genuinely enjoying telling her things that he knows because mm. he thinks she'll be interested mm. yeah. um and yeah. also i feel like it's it's kind of interesting i feel like a lot of their conversations are him sort of not testing her exactly but he's kind of like He's poking a little bit. He, he wants, wants to know what to, she he thinks. He wants to figure and... her out. He wants to like, um, almost, in some ways I feel like he's trying to work out what's going on in her head beneath the like, because you know, the, the, some of, some of the stuff is very obvious. The like, her getting confused about what happens in gothic novels versus what happens in reality and yeah. all of this. And you can kind of see him, there's a couple of times where he sort of prods her in a sort of like, oh, if you were a goth, and I think it's clear that, from the reader's perspective that that's what he's doing but she doesn't always pick up on it is that he Mm. goes oh you must feel x about this thing because that's what a gothic heroine would feel like you know it's like oh you would oh you must be like for example when she works out finally what's going on with isabella and he's like oh well you must this must have like rent your heart in twain you you know you must feel like half of your soul is gone you can never return to bath for the scene of the betrayal blah, blah 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 and she thinks about it for a minute and she goes no, nah, I think I'm all right, actually. Yeah. Is that bad? Yeah. And he's yeah. like, no, no, that's what I was looking for. You know, he's yeah. he, he's checking to see how much of that is like... She enjoys it versus she... You know, if it's like indelibly in her character yeah. that, that, she's, that she can't tell fiction from reality or that she's not... Well, you know. and then you get the bit later where she goes to stay at his house, the house of his yeah. family, mm. and convinces herself that um, his father murdered his mother years ago. Mm. And he is so shocked when he realizes mm. that's what she's convinced herself of i mean that's wild mm. <laughs> yeah i mean i mean it absolutely is and it's and it's very much later it's oh she's really uh, embarrassed about this flight of fancy that she sent herself on but mm. i think in part because he has done that probing and he's like oh okay she is like sensible and i like her but or whatever. he's like mm. on the way there he's like teasing her he's like oh what yes. do you think the abbey's gonna be like and he's sort of setting us all it's gonna be gothic it's gonna be moody it's gonna be dark and dingy and they yeah. have secrets and dark corridors he's like trying to have fun and tease her and then it it goes a bit too far well she kind of takes it literally and she's like well mm. not takes it literally but there's a bit where she's thinking it's seriously oh, was he was he being serious was he was he being serious about what he was saying like in that in that carriage mm. ride and um, and there's a bunch of sort of circumstantial evidence which really isn't it's just yeah. that she doesn't like general tilney very much and turns out to be right that he is a bit of a dick so yeah and i definitely definitely appreciate like having read like a castle of otranto wuthering heights dracula like mm. i know they're like a fr- wuthering heights and dracula come you know much later than this book but having read more gothic novels it's kind of it is I pick you picking up on the satire of 
it, it it's sort of like you know the um the movies that like took the piss out the Twilight films. Mm, like that yeah. and it's kind of and she's like oh there's a spooky cabinet what's in the spooky cabinet oh there's some paper and it's like a laundry list and she's like oh yeah. i wanted something exciting and it's just a laundry list and then i like, do i do really enjoy the escalation good. of her misinterpreting what's going on in the abbey because like there's a couple of instances it's, i mean it's kind of rule of three there's like first there's the mysterious chest in her room that turns out to have a perfectly innocent explanation and have like bed sheets in or something yeah and then there's the mysterious cabinet that with the secret manuscript that turns out to be the laundry list. And each time she's like, God, I'm so stupid. I can't believe I fell for that. That's really yeah. embarrassing. I hope nobody finds out about it. And none of that is enough to stop her from like, from one thing that like Eleanor says about like, oh, it's not even something that Eleanor says. It's something I that like- I think it is. Her- it's the fact that her mother died suddenly and Eleanor wasn't home yeah. at the time. Yeah. And yeah. it's yeah. kind of- it was kind of like, because when she turns up, she's like, oh, it's very light in the room. And even though the windows were, she was expected to be dark and dingy in the room. So she's sort of coming in with this preconception um, mm-hmm. of what it's going to be like. And then when, yeah, when Eleanor says, oh, yeah, my mother died, what, nine years ago, um, mm. suddenly. Um, and it was very sad, blah, blah, blah. And Catherine's like, oh, can I ask more questions about that? And as a reader, I'm like, I'm sorry. What the f- what? Yeah, no, like, you are so overstepping, rude. my friend. Like, it's like you're overstepping that boundary. And then she's like, oh, <laughs> therefore, oh, because the dad doesn't have the portrait in his room because, I don't know, maybe he loved his wife and it makes him sad. She's gone, oh, no, he must have hated her. And mm. and like and I know he doesn't he doesn't walk her favorite walk every day in remembrance so he must yeah, yeah and it's just, he must never have loved bit, her it's a bit far fetched but but she is seventeen and sheltered so I see what it's kind of interesting I feel like it sort of plays into there's a repeated thing in this where we get Austin kind of goes okay if this was a gothic novel yeah what yeah, would yeah, happen yeah. right now is X. Yeah. You know, and it would be like, and it's always people would take this to like this dramatic extreme. People would be, you know, f- vast family feuds would spring up yeah. ar- around these like tiny misunderstandings. Yeah, Catherine would see Henry Tilney with a beautiful woman that she didn't recognise and immediately assume he was previously engaged and that, you know, yeah. he'd betrayed her. And actually, it's just his sister. And in the in the actual book, that's immediately what she assumes because he's mentioned having yeah. a sister. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think it's really interesting that like a lot of the time, Catherine also has those reactions, the normal person reactions of like, she doesn't blow things out of proportion most of the time. She's like, like the, like the conversation about Isabella where she's like, well, I'm sad, but I'm not going, you know, I'm not going to like, my soul is not forever rent in twain or what the f*** ever. I'm just, you know, I'll get over it, you know? You know, this person I thought was my friend is a bit of a s*** actually, sort of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, And she has a similar reaction to like, um henry tilney like going going to the abbey and you know like wanting to spend more time with henry tilney where she's like okay well i'd like to stay in bath a bit longer because then i Mm -hmm. get to spend more time with henry and with eleanor and that'll be really nice Mm. and then and it says it says something like she didn't even really think about the future or like you know the the barest perhaps of like expectations from henry she's just like I like spending time with them and it's nice that I get to spend more time with them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah, know? Yeah. And like in a gothic novel and in a different Austen novel, I think yeah. people get much more committed to that. You know, there's so many, like, there's so many moments where there's a minor misunderstanding where Austen's like, oh, this should blow up into X. And like, and Catherine's just mostly too Biden. sensible to fall for it. Yeah. And- mostly mm-hmm. she's just like, I'm not, I'm not paying attention to this. It's not interesting. To be, you know, to, to be honest, I, I think it's one of the things that's sort of in a similar way to persuasion, unlike mm. Pride and Prejudice, which again, as I mentioned, it's the only one I've read previously. Um, mm. Like in Pride and Prejudice, the whole, obviously the whole thing is about marriage and I guess it's ish in sense and sensibility. But like I feel in persuasion, it's more, Roman- romantic and this sort of you know this 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 long romance between these two characters and in this book in particular like compatibility i would say yeah, yeah. Mm. it's more about compatibility like in this book i didn't i didn't get the impression that Catherine was head over heels falling in love with henry she was like oh i mm. like him i want to spend more time mm. with him but it you didn't yeah. have this internal monologue of like oh i cannot wait to see him the next day when he came in and he the sun glinted off his head and i was like oh my god his head like whatever i don't know <laughs> yeah and like when she gets thrown out of northanger abbey so what happens is the general the, uh, henry Tilney's father has been laboring under the impression that Catherine is way more rich than she actually is 
and when he finds out that he was wrong and this misconception was both created and then cleared up by horrible john thorpe um yeah. when he realizes that he Catherine isn't rich he basically orders her thrown out of his home because he's like oh you're not going to marry my son if you don't have money um which i think is the closest we get to actual gothic novel behavior yeah this whole time <laughs> And so Catherine is like thrown out on her ear, has to make a 70 mile journey home by herself, which was like the chances of things actually happening to her were quite low, but it was still like absolutely not the done thing. It was really like a shock that he has done this. Mm. Um, and on the journey, she's sort of like, she's actually not like going, oh, I shall be beset by highwaymen. She's like, I wonder what my friends are going to think. Like, because Eleanor, her, the sister, has been made to go and tell her that she's been thrown out. And mm. she's like, oh, well, I hope, I hope this, you know, I hope this isn't too hard on them. I wonder what Henry's going to do when he comes back and finds out. Like, mm. she's just very kind and of... And she's confused about why it happened. Such she's... a relatable reaction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's another one where, like, when she gets home and she's really worried that if she tell, she doesn't want to tell her parents what happened because she's worried that they'll think Henry and Eleanor are terrible people as well. Mm. And actually her parents are just like, no, the general's a bit weird. It's, it's not, that wasn't very nice of him. Um... It's a good job you probably won't see him again. And then when Henry comes to explain, it's a rip. I've just realised it's a repeat of that thing where she like pelts after them the day after the carriage incident, being like, "I'm so sorry. I didn't. I did not give them permission to say that. Like, I I had a prior engagement. I wanted to come with you guys. He, they straight up lied to you about yeah. you know me wanting to go. Please with let them me make the apologies on behalf of this other person. Like, you know, apologise for yeah. you being hurt. Yeah, by, yeah. yeah. And like Henry basically yeah. comes and does the same thing. He's like, look. I, I didn't know my dad was going to do that. I This is what happened. I'm so sorry. I do actually care about you a great deal. And can we like talk about that? And her parents are just like, yeah, this seems like a nice young man. They don't go, mm. oh, uh, the our families the must forever hate each other because of this insult yeah. your father paid to our beloved daughter. They're just like, oh, he seems genuinely like embarrassed and upset that his dad would do this thing. What a good bean. I'm glad he's friends with our daughter. <laughs> It's been said a couple of times through the novel by, I think, mostly Catherine, but that her parents really just care that their children should end up being happy and having a life that they deserve. Like, they mm. don't care about them marrying for money. They don't care about, you know, appearances that much, except yeah. that uh, insofar as appearances will benefit them materially. Mm. Um, and so, you know, then they don't mind that her father-in-law might be a bit of a dick as long as she likes the guy that she's going to end up marrying. Um, yeah. And it's sort of immediately obvious that this is the case. And there's this really sweet yeah. bit where Henry has turned up at the house and he basically makes an excuse to get Catherine to like take a walk alone with him. And everybody is just like, oh, yeah, they should definitely do that. Let's let's gently conspire to make sure this happens. Yeah, exactly. Um, mm. You know, one of Catherine's younger sisters goes, oh, but you don't need to do that. And the parents are just like, no, 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 it's fine. They should do that. <laughs> they should go and have a walk <laughs> together. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just like, oh, the Moreland parents. Good. Good parenting. Mm. Good. We like good them. Eggs. Yeah. Possibly the only good parents in Austin, maybe. Yeah, I mean, we talked about the Bennett's failings as parents, didn't we? Because mm. I was going to say those are the other parents that I like. but I like the Dashwood mother, mm. but like the dad is obviously a s*** <laughs> because like, yes. poor financial planning and, and just oh, general absolutely. like bull <laughs> Most of the parenting in, in that book is just very, very bad. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um. I think compared to all the other Austens we've read on this podcast is the fact that in this, I feel like Jane Austen as a narrator is like talking directly to the reader. The narrator yeah. is more of a character in their own right. And and it's kind yeah. of, it's really sort of interesting, especially when you listen to audiobook because you feel like she's talking directly to you. Mm. Um, ah. There are some great like bits where she's talking about, what was it, the guy Richard who, did, who lived up to his name? In all. Oh yeah, he was unfortunately named Richard. Yeah, but he lived up to it, and I was like, "Yeah, that's a burn." Um, and she's talking about, you know, oh, in my novel, da, 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 um, mm. when they're talking about when Catherine's talking about how much she loves novels, and other people have put it down, and mm. and Lisa Austin just has this bit in the middle. Of all. Yeah, I was just like, "Why would you write a novel where your protagonist doesn't like reading? You're an author. Why would you make it seem like reading isn't yeah. cool?" <laughs> and I just yeah. love that as like a little rant that she goes on. There's there's so many little like looks into the camera like she's on the office. Yeah, moments yeah, to yeah. Jane Austen, where she's like something happens and then she'll turn to you and she'll be like, ah, oh, and obviously this means that this ca- this guy cannot be the the instigator of the you know the three villains who will shove our heroine into a carriage and that will drag her somewhere against her will at top speed and you know 
And like contrary to all expectations, Mrs. Allen was not in fact going to lead our heroine into a life of sin and depravity by not looking after her properly, but was just going to be a bit boring and talk about hats a lot. Yeah. Like mm-hmm. she'll introduce a character and then she'll be like, and we could expect, you know, because this is an, a, a novel that, um, you know, this character is going to behave in these ways and perform these roles for the heroine. But actually, oh, my favorite example of this, my favorite example of this, because it contrasts so nicely with like the whole Marianne thing and sense and sensibility where she's like ill for a month because yeah. she's had too many emotions. Oh, I know too exactly what you're going to mention. Yeah, go on. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so there's a bit where like, I think I can't remember which specific bath incident it is that stresses her out. <laughs> There's like some ball. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's one of the Isab- early Isabella misunderstandings where Isabella's like a bit of a shit and she's like confused and upset by it. And it's like. I think she cost her some time with Tilney. And I think Isabella, uh, not Isabella, Catherine had to dance with John Thorpe a lot that evening yeah, as well. Yeah. 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 yeah which yeah, would yeah. put anyone in a bad mood. Yeah. 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 And then Austin's like, and, con- and you know, and instead of what we would expect, like which is presumably you know that she wouldn't eat and that she wouldn't sleep and that this would send her wasting away for like months at a time with mm, the, this di- mm. with the disappointment yeah Catherine instead found that the anxiety made her ravenously hungry uh, at which point she then slept for nine hours and everything was better in the morning and it's just yeah like, it's, it's so really good. sweet <laughs> yeah but it's also like such a drag on the like oh you know one one tiny misunderstanding and now I'm gonna I'm gonna die of feelings and she's just like I ate a really big dinner and I was fine. <laughs> so the book that they reference constantly, um, that mm. she and Isabella reference constantly, is the the Castle of Ado- the Mysteries of Adolfo. I think it's called. Yes, and yeah, it's yeah. it's a gothic novel written by Anne Radcliffe. And I read the TV tropes page for this novel so that I could like mm. understand what was going on when they're referencing it. And the main character in that book, Emily, faints. I think no less than eight times throughout that novel, <laughs> and is, in, yeah. is insensate for hours and hours and never remembers what's happened after she's woken up. And that's not counting. The the times that she almost faints and it's like you know she she sees like you know somebody mentions that her fiance might be hurt she passes out in a dead faint and so <laughs> like that contrasted with Catherine being like you know what i had some food and i had some sleep and everything was better yeah <laughs> just yeah, like yeah, yeah. words to live by <laughs> So just like the contrast with a Tranto as well, where it's like, you know, they're mm. like piling misunderstanding on top of misunderstanding and literally yeah. nobody knows what's actually going on any second of any day. And like everybody's convinced that everybody's dead like half the time. <laughs> uh-huh. And instead of that, you with this, you're just like, there was a minor misunderstanding and it was resolved the next day and everybody was reasonably calm about it. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's just, just, like, just to flex on Castle of a Tranto specifically. There was one of those in Sense and Sensibility as well, right? There was like mm. a misunderstanding in Sense and Sensibility that I was convinced convinced was going to turn into one of those and then it was just like immediately resolved and i can't remember what it was but it's so refreshing when that happens yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. it's like the opposite of manufactured uh, conflict yeah mm. i was i was something i've been talking about with ted lasso if i know you guys haven't seen that no i'm yet. saving it for when i have enough no, spoons because yeah, i know it's it. gonna like kick kick the shit out of me emotionally yeah emotionally mm-hmm. it will destroy you but like in a very good way and one of the ways it does that is by there are moments where in any other show what would be a you 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 can see mm, the manufactured drama coming the like the extreme yeah. we're gonna let this thing de- we're gonna blow this whole thing out of proportion and it's gonna destroy our relationship and, and then it like, just deflates it immediately yeah yeah and they just never go there you you can trust them not to do that like will they destroy you and gut you emotionally absolutely yes but like they, it's They'll never, never the cheap, cheap like mm-hmm. it, you know um the, none of the relationship misunderstandings get like blown up into these like massive we can we can never be together bullshit it's always like we're adults and we have a conversation about it and then it's fixed or maybe it's not it still fixed sucks, and we keep working but on it yeah 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 and like this kind of has that but in a very like comic way in a very like i i deliberately you know i was like oh um in a, any other book I'm telling you what would happen if this was a gothic novel and then yeah. I'm going to go, but my characters didn't do that because they're not thick. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's like, kind of like my yeah. characters, my heroine will do this. And it just, I don't know, mm. it was it was a satisfyingly different way to listen to an audiobook. I don't know. I liked it. Mm. Yeah. So thinking of the characters in this book, uh, I think we're all settled that we would want to punch John Thorpe, right? Absolutely. Like, oh, of, yeah. Is there anyone else that you want to punch? I kind of want to slap Isabella. I think Captain Tony for his like timekeeping. Like, because he's just really like, oh, this must be at 10 past this, this must be 10 past this. And I read yeah. somewhere it's because it was like the recent introduction of the pocket watch or something like that. Uh, hey. So so that's why he was like, really we should make it a status time. thing as well, I guess. It's like, mm. look at me. I'm cool enough to have a pocket. I'm mm. cool and rich enough to have a pocket yeah. watch. Therefore, yeah. 
Yeah. Or like I think the like thing that. with General Tilney is that I was kind of because I did read this novel before, but like ages ago, I was kind of expecting it to turn out not that you know that he'd murdered his wife, but that he was at least like a really <laughs> shitty parent because there's a lot of the like it's repeatedly noted by Catherine that she has a great time with his kids as long as he's not there. And when he's yeah. there, he's like really nice to her, but like the the kids are like really quiet and they don't yeah. seem to be like. Uh, in good so here's spirits. what I think is the explanation for that is that mm. he only likes her because he thinks she's rich, and mm. the kids know yeah. that that's not the case. So they're like, "Why is he being so nice?" Yeah, 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 yeah. But like, there's other stuff like the fact that Eleanor's so lonely living on her own in that in the house, and the way that Henry talks about because Henry doesn't live in Northanger Abbey full time. He's got his like um, curacy somewhere else. And he's talking about, yeah, the, just the way they frame the, like, we would, neither of us would be in the house with our father if we had a choice. Yeah. There's also the whole plot line of Eleanor having had a suitor and him being mm. deemed unsuitable for lack of money. And then mm. the, the resolution to the book is that he turns up having inherited an estate. Mm. Eleanor marries him and then the general's like, well, one of my kids has married into money, so I guess you, Henry, can marry this randomer. Catherine um, and I won't <laughs> kick up a fuss about it and that's the resolution is kind of a deus ex machina thing oh uh, no I wonder it's deliberately not because Jane Austen is like unless I be accused of introducing a character <laughs> at the last minute who like you know I'll be breaking all the rules of proper writing if I threw in a random character at the end that I haven't mentioned before mm. it's this dude that you saw in this one off scene like <laughs> I think there's a better level ago. to that where like it still is absolutely breaking the rules right but mm. it's a kind of, uh, I think of it as like a, a, a comment on the fact that real life does not follow narrative tropes like that, mm. which is kind of the point of this book, right? Is that it's not an author novel. It's not following the most yeah, dramatic yeah, yeah. and like narrative way that it could go. And like, we won't have met everybody in Eleanor's life, you know? We won't, like, it's ridiculous to assume that like Catherine on having known her for like two months or whatever, knows her entire history and everybody that she's ever been in love with. And- it sort of reminds me of that Pratchett quote about um, mysteries and clues. Like how, like how mm. insulting to the rich variety of human experience to and reduce it down. There's a lot down. of that going on, isn't there? Yeah. There's just this kind of like, uh, I've put these things together and I, I have no, I've never once considered that there's another way that any of these events could be construed. Yeah, exactly. It's just, it's, I mean, it's theories, it's theories ahead of facts. It's twisting facts to suit theories instead yeah. of theories to suit facts. Mm. And so I think that's kind of like, you know, in so far, like, I don't know if it was written that way because Austin realised she'd written herself into a corner and couldn't figure out how to get the two main couple together. Or mm. if it was just like intended this way, but as a sort of remark upon the fact that, yeah, real life is weird and unpredictable and messy yeah. and, and yeah. unsatisfying narratively sometimes which is fine yeah i also enjoyed the thing at the end where she was like okay i i know this seems like it's really tense and that they're not going to get married because general tilney's an ass but like as you can tell by the rapid compression of the narrative because you're like two pages <laughs> from the end at that point obviously something is going to come out of the blue and make it okay for them to get married yeah it's this sort of like self-referential fourth mm. wall breaking um, yeah that yeah i really enjoy and i think austin was like is really well positioned mm. to do in terms of the kind of writing mm. that she does yeah 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 i agree i think it's 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 really interesting as a contrast to sense and sensibility because like mm. yeah she's like directly commenting on all these narrative tropes here and it's like you were not in a gothic novel she's very clear about that she's like oh no you know my i've, I've disadvantaged my heroine by making her normal <laughs> and like three-dimensional <laughs> i'm a terrible author like there's a lot of that like meta level and then in sense and sensibility it's like some of these characters are in a gothic novel and some of them are behaving like they've got, they're in a gothic novel yeah but in the end like actually there are normal people going what the f- are you doing and like just managing while all of this f- is happening yeah, yeah. Sense and sensibility was much less fun as a novel for sure mm. um and i don't know if it's because this one is much more like conceived of as like a whole like it feels like a more self-contained like neat piece of narrative mm. then sense of sensibility felt a bit scattered to me mm. i think partially it's because it's like it's intended as a parody the whole time so it's kind of like i think it's a bit more consistent yes like parody rather than commentary yeah whereas i think sense and sensibility has a bit of a like i mean to be fair, i think one of the places where they match is that i think this is one of the ones where austin pays less attention to developing the relationship but oh, like okay yeah I'm, like because I mean she, I mean oh, she she's, she's pointing at it with a, a joke and a laugh like oh I've just I've written them together I fixed them in like two pages and now they're fine together and everything's great 
But the difference is that, like, Henry Tilney has a personality. Yes, the issue there with them being together is not that you don't believe in the relationship, it's that there's logistics. Whereas the issue that I had with sense of sensibility was that I just didn't believe that they liked each other at the end. Yeah. So it all felt very hollow. I think for me, Mm. I... The thing that struck me about this one is that I also wasn't super convinced in that I felt like... Or, like, I don't know, I feel like giving them time is at the end of the novel makes a lot of sense because I feel like Henry Henry's done his prodding and he's kind of worked out that at the core here is somebody that, like, he could respect and get on with, which I think is... That's another interesting dimension of the conversation about Isabella because Henry and Eleanor are both, like, our brother won't be happy with an idiot who's a mean bitch, so we shouldn't maybe let him, like he shouldn't yeah. marry her we don't approve actually. yeah yeah whereas and like they specifically don't approve because they think she'll be bad for him as a person they they're they're yeah. expecting the mr bennett mrs bennett problem whereas Catherine yeah. is, is kind of sitting there going oh he's the he's the worst kind of idiot because he's you know like he's ruined he's ruined he's done this thing that's hurt my brother and he's being unfaithful and stupid and isabella's also being unfaithful and stupid and it's all very dramatic and they're just looking at his life choices and going, uh, I don't think you should be doing that, mate. That's not going to work out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she's she's kind of like, well, obviously they're going to get married now and they should. And Henry and Eleanor are like, oh, no, I don't think that would be a good idea, specifically because they think that they won't be able to respect each other or like, you know, they, they don't they don't have that compatibility. Yeah. And I yeah. think the fact that Henry spends so much time yeah. like sort of testing Catherine out for that. Mm-hmm. And he's kind yeah. of the, the way that he's sort of checking about how she genuinely feels about things and Mm. the fact that that doesn't often when like left cold it doesn't often like conform to narrative tropes like it's not her gut instinct most of the time to be like everybody around me is a character in a gothic novel and has probably (laughs) murdered somebody she actually kind of has to be led to it you know yeah 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 and like and you know she's 17 and she's like alone with like you know it's her first time away from home visiting almost complete strangers She's Mm -hmm. sort of stuck in this house that she's got this like gothic preconception of. It's kind of understanding that and understandable that she's a bit like on edge and a bit silly and a bit nervous and you know easily led. And she's just been like encouraged, like been sort of um, uh, what's the word I'm Mm. talking for? Like uh, sort of wound up a bit by Henry on the ride over, being like, "Oh, it's this spooky gothic mansion." Because she can't always tell when he's he's joshing (laughs) her. I think. Yeah, yeah. But he, he seems like the kind of character, I mean, this is a testament to him actually having characterization that mm. that does a very good line in Deadpan. Yeah, it's very it's mm. very rounded. Rounded. I guess my question for you guys would be, who gets the F-bomb and when? Mm. Mm-hmm. I feel, mm. uh, in my opinion, Catherine should get it when uh, John Thorpe doesn't stop the carriage and she's just like, just should be like, fuck you, you should stop it. Mine is really silly, but you know Mrs. Allen is like obsessed with her dresses and she's like talking yeah. about muslin all the time. She should like yeah. drop some something on her dress and just go, oh, f- <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that'd be quite good. That'd be quite I was just saying, the, the, the weight of swearing in this book, I think I'm almost against putting an F-bomb in it because it's one of the bits that's used to characterize John Thorpe as an asshole is that is his swears? every other word is a damn. I guess, yeah, Mm. that's a good point. So, like, in my head, in this book, Mm. swearing, I associate with him and specifically with it being a sign of the kind of (laughs) head that he is. So, to give anybody else a swear, I'm sort of like, oh, I don't... Mm. It's only one swear, I don't know who I would... Yeah. It's one swear. It's fine. And (laughs) (laughs) what what do you think our darling, our darling dearest goth mug would rate this book? See, much as I enjoyed this book... I don't know mm. that the cat would rate it very highly. There are no cats. No. There's no crime. There's, There's no not ribbons. really that much deception. There's mm. not actually any horror or murder. There's no actual stabbing. There is no. There is one ribbon. There is one piece of ribbon in the entire book, which is like Catherine is in town and she has to go off and buy a piece of ribbon. Mm. And that's it. Um, so that's honestly, it. I feel like, uh, yeah, much as I love this book, I think it might be a one or a two. Is this not enough drama? Yeah. Like, it keeps it keeps offering, like, a potentially, like, teasing you that there's going to be drama, it's going to be big and dramatic, and then it's never actually big and dramatic. The cat doesn't enjoy that. That's when the claws come out, you know? Yeah, yeah. I don't think she's yeah. enjoy that. The cat does that. not enjoy being wound up to be only to be let down. You need the drama payoff. Yeah. I, I yeah. think she's yeah. not yeah. the payoff. Yeah, I think mm. it's a solid two from the cat. 
yeah. keeping the integrity of the cat rating. Like I enjoyed it immensely. Yeah. Oh yeah, I loved it. Oh yeah, but the cat. <laughs> but that's <laughs> it. Our <laughs> rating is distinct from the cat rating. <laughs> yeah, very important note. I give this like fifteen out of ten. I really enjoyed it. Um, <laughs> I don't know if I would go that high, but I definitely enjoyed it far more than I was worried I might. Like we we yeah. recorded yeah. this episode less than a week after the last one, and so I really like had to. I mean, I, yeah, like I said, I mean, this. I finished it. I think mean, we both speed finished it, it like an hour. Yeah, I speed read recording. it. I sped. I speed read it today. Sped read. Speed yeah. read. Um, yeah, I, mm. I I read it all today in like an hour and a half. Yeah, because um, I was going to say like, what else have you been reading? But literally, I don't know. Nope. I've literally <laughs> only been listening. I listened to the audiobook of this by Judith mm. Stevenson again, who also read the Wuthering Heights uh, audiobook, mm. which was really really good. I really enjoyed it. So yeah, yeah, highly recommend audiobooks, guys. If you're struggling with the words, I hate I hate to say it. I hate to say it, but I did actually read something that wasn't this. I I Was brought, I brought this upon myself <laughs> because the English translations of the MXTX novels, the first volumes uh, of those, came out this week, uh, okay. and I got Scum Villain. I got the first volume of Scum Villain on Kindle, and it was really good. Oh, I'm glad you enjoyed that. I've heard good things from other friends. Yeah, I lost I lost two days in the middle of this week when I was supposed <laughs> to be reading Northanger to Scum Villain's self saving system, and it was really funny i enjoyed yeah. it immensely yeah it was worth it even for the like having to get up early this morning and like cram northanger abbey into my brain <laughs> i mean I, I went to the hairdresser so i was like i had the headphones in and i was like i'm really sorry i've just got to get, get through this audio book <laughs> like, no you don't normally let like, you have a little chit chat the hairdressers I'm, like, I'm sorry i've got to get i've got to yeah. pl- plow through <laughs> that's the exact yeah. reason i don't go to the hairdresser because i'm incapable of making hairdresser small talk I just bully my housemates into shaving my head. This yeah, <laughs> we've got a self-sufficient hair system going on. Unless I can't yes. do that, I, 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 I cannot. I, I, I had to go out in the real world, but it was great. Yeah. I mean, the guy was great, so it was, it was a good time. <laughs> anyway. Well, we've got a lo- we've got a fair bit of time before we're, we're actually we've got like because uh, as of recording just to date this episode we're about to go into like the Christmas break so we've got a little bit of time before we re- record our next episode which will be yeah. um, a long way to a small angry planet yeah which I'm very excited about I'm I've heard so very good things about mm, um, I have yes. ordered a copy from Biblio it is on its way to me hopefully soon. Mm. Yeah, and maybe I will even read something else before then, so that when the question what? comes up every time, what else you've been reading, I'll have something to say. Imagine yeah, that. Yeah, I might uh, actually end up finishing book ten of the Wheel of Time, which I've literally been sitting on for about a year. <laughs> like it's it, it's a, it's been if yeah, it's it's the one I struggle with, but I'm like I'm gonna I'm gonna mm. finish it. I'm gonna finish it. But yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. Thank you all so much for listening. Remember to follow us on your podcast platform. Uh, so you never miss an episode and if you enjoyed this episode please consider giving us a like or a review on your platform if possible um, and share the episode with your family and friends uh, if you think they'd enjoy it too you can also connect with us on all our socials which are all linked down below or email us uh, at teaching my cat to read at gmail.com we will have reply eventually we just have real world life in the way yeah we're all um, zombies so much, we're all dead so in many the brain responsibilities. The Seriously, if you email yeah. us yeah. it will make our 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 day life yeah. year month yeah who what is the concept no, we of love it anymore? it makes us very happy we're just also all very tired and, and busy. stupid yeah. and thus <laughs> yeah. incapable yeah. of responding to things but yeah um <laughs> say hello send us a message and recommend us some books to read big virtual hugs and we'll see you next time bye bye, bye.